The Song of Hiawatha, Two, The Four Winds, by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, read by Frank Blissett. Honor be to Mudjikewis, cried the warriors, cried the old men, when he came in triumph homeward with the sacred belt of wampum from the regions of the north wind, from the kingdom of Wabasso, from the land of the white rabbit. He had stolen the belt of wampum from the neck of Mishimakwa, from the great bear of the mountains, from the terror of the nations, as he lay asleep and cumbrous on the summit of the mountains, like a rock with mosses on it, spotted brown and gray with mosses. Silently he stole upon him, till the red nails of the monster almost touched him, almost scared him, till the hot breath of his nostrils warmed the hands of Mudjikewis, as he drew the belt of wampum over the round ears that heard not, over the small eyes that saw not, over the long nose and nostrils, the black muffle of the nostrils, out of which the heavy breathing warmed the hands of Mudjikewis. Then he swung aloft his war-club, shouted loud and long his war-cry, smote the mighty Mishimakwa in the middle of the forehead, right between the eyes he smote him. With the heavy blow bewildered rose the great bear of the mountains, but his knees beneath him trembled, and he whimpered like a woman, as he reeled and staggered forward, as he sat upon his haunches. And the mighty Mudjikewis, standing fearlessly before him, taunted him in loud derision, spake disdainfully in this wise. Hark, you bear, you are a coward, and no brave as you pretended, else you would not cry and whimper like a miserable woman. Bear, you know our tribes are hostile, long have been at war together. Now you find that we are strongest, you go sneaking in the forest, you go hiding in the mountains. Had you conquered me in battle, not a groan would I have uttered, but you, bear, sit here and whimper, and disgrace your tribe by crying like a wretched Shugadea, like a cowardly old woman. Then again he raised his war-club, smote again the Mishimakwa in the middle of the forehead, broke his skull as ice is broken when one goes to fish in winter. Thus was slain the Mishimakwa, he the great bear of the mountains, he the terror of the nations. Honor be to Mudjikewis, with a shout exclaimed the people. Honor be to Mudjikewis, henceforth he shall be the west wind, and hereafter and forever shall he hold supreme dominion over all the winds of heaven. Call him no more Mudjikewis, call him Kebayon, the west wind. Thus was Mudjikewis chosen father of the winds of heaven, for himself he kept the west wind, gave the others to his children. Unto Wabin gave the east wind, gave the south to Shawandasi, and the north wind, wild and cruel, to the fierce Kebibanoka. Young and beautiful was Wabin. He it was who brought the morning, he it was whose silver arrows chased the dark o'er hill and valley, he it was whose cheeks were painted with the brightest streaks of crimson, and whose voice awoke the village, called the deer, and called the hunter. 
Lonely in the sky was Wobin, though the birds sang gaily to him, though the wild flowers of the meadow filled the air with odors for him, though the forests and the rivers sang and shouted at his coming, still his heart was sad within him, for he was alone in heaven. But one morning, gazing earthward, while the village still was sleeping, and the fog lay on the river, like a ghost that goes at sunrise, he beheld a maiden walking all alone upon a meadow, gathering water flags and rushes by a river in the meadow. Every morning, gazing earthward, still the first thing he beheld there was her blue eyes looking at him, two blue lakes among the rushes. And he loved the lonely maiden, who thus waited for his coming. For they both were solitary, she on earth and he in heaven. And he wooed her with caresses, wooed her with his smile of sunshine, with his flattering words he wooed her, with his sighing and his singing, gentlest whispers in the branches, softest music, sweetest odors, till he drew her to his bosom, folded in his robes of crimson, till into a star he changed her, trembling still upon his bosom. And forever in the heavens they are seen together walking, Wabin and the Wabin Anung, Wabin and the Star of Morning. But the fierce Kabibanoka had his dwelling among icebergs, in the everlasting snowdrifts, in the kingdom of Wabasso, in the land of the white rabbit. He it was whose hand in autumn painted all of the trees with scarlet, stained the leaves with red and yellow. He it was who sent the snowflake, sifting, hissing through the forest, froze the ponds, the lakes, the rivers, drove the loon and seagull southward, drove the cormorant and curlew to their nests of sedge and sea-tang in the realms of Shawandasi. Once the fierce Kabibanoka issued from his lodge of snowdrifts, from his home among the icebergs, and his hair, with snow besprinkled, streamed behind him like a river, like a black and wintry river, as he howled and hurried southward over frozen lakes and moorlands. There among the reeds and rushes found he Shingibis, the diver, trailing strings of fish behind him, or the frozen fens and moorlands lingering still among the moorlands, though his tribe had long departed to the land of Shawandasi. Cried the fierce Kabibanoka, Who is this that dares to brave me, dares to stay in my dominions when the Wawa has departed, when the wild goose has gone southward, and the Huron, the Shushuga, long ago departed southward? I will go into his wigwam, I will put his smoldering fire out. And at night Kabibanoka to the lodge came wild and wailing, heaped the snow in drifts about it, shouted down into the smoke flue, shook the lodge poles in his fury, flapped the curtain of the doorway. Shingabis the diver feared not, Shingabis the diver cared not, Four great logs had he for firewood, one for each moon of the winter, and for food the fishes served him. By his blazing fire he sat there, warm and merry, eating, laughing, singing, O oh, Kabebanoka, you are but my fellow mortal. Then Kabebanoka entered, 
and though Shingibus, the diver, felt his presence by the coldness, felt his icy breath upon him, still he did not cease his singing, still he did not leave his laughing, only turned the log a little, only made the fire burn brighter, made the sparks fly up the smoke flue. From Kabibinoka's forehead, from his snow-besprinkled tresses, drops of sweat fell fast and heavy, making dints upon the ashes, as along the eaves of lodges, as from drooping boughs of hemlock, drips the melting snow in springtime, making hollows in the snowdrifts till at last he rose defeated, could not bear the heat and laughter, could not bear the merry singing, but rushed headlong through the doorway, stamped upon the crusted snowdrifts, stamped upon the lakes and rivers, made the snow upon them harder, made the ice upon them thicker, challenged Shingibus the diver to come forth and wrestle with him, to come forth and wrestle naked on the frozen fens and moorlands. Forth went Shingibus the diver, wrestled all night with the north wind, wrestled naked on the moorlands with the fierce Kabibinoka, till his panting breath grew fainter, till his frozen grasp grew feebler, till he reeled and staggered backward, and retreated, baffled, beaten, to the kingdom of Wabasso, to the land of the white rabbit, hearing still the gusty laughter, hearing Shingibus the diver singing, O oh, Kebibinoka, you are but my fellow mortal. Shawandasi, fat and lazy, had his dwelling far to southward, in the drowsy, dreamy sunshine, in the never-ending summer. He it was who sent the wood-birds, sent the robin, the opichi, sent the bluebird, the oasa, sent the shaw-shaw, sent the swallow, sent the wild goose, wawa, northward, sent the melons and tobacco and the grapes in purple clusters. From his pipe the smoke ascending filled the sky with haze and vapor, filled the air with dreamy softness, gave a twinkle to the water, touched the rugged hills with smoothness, brought the tender Indian summer to the melancholy northland in the dreary moon of snowshoes. Listless, careless, Shawandasi. In his life he had one shadow, in his heart one sorrow had he. Once as he was gazing northward, far away upon a prairie, he beheld a maiden standing, saw a tall and slender maiden all alone upon a prairie, brightest green were all her garments, and her hair was like the sunshine. Day by day he gazed upon her, day by day he sighed with passion, day by day his heart within him grew more hot with love and longing for the maid with yellow tresses. But he was too fat and lazy to bestir himself and woo her, yes, too indolent and easy to pursue her and persuade her, so he only gazed upon her, only sat and sighed with passion for the maiden of the prairie. Till one morning, looking northward, he beheld her yellow tresses, changed and covered o'er with whiteness, covered as with whitest snowflakes. Ah, my brother from the Northland, from the kingdom of Wabasso, from the land of the White Rabbit, you have stolen the maiden from me, you have laid your hand upon her, you have wooed and won my maiden with your stories of the Northland. 
Thus the wretched Shawandasi breathed into the air his sorrow, and the south wind o'er the prairie wandered warm with sighs of passion, with the sighs of Shawandasi, till the air seemed full of snowflakes, full of thistle down the prairie, and the maid with hair like sunshine vanished from his sight forever. Never more did Shawandasi see the maid with yellow tresses. Poor deluded Shawandasi, t'was no woman that you gazed at, t'was no maiden that you sighed for, t'was the prairie dandelion that through all of the dreamy summer you had gazed at with such longing, you had sighed for with such passion, and had puffed away forever, blown into the air with sighing. Ah, deluded Shawandasi! Thus the four winds were divided. Thus the sons of Mujikius had their stations in the heavens, at the corners of the heavens. For himself the west wind only kept the mighty Mujikius. That was... The Song of Hiawatha Two The Four Winds by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow Read by Frank Blissett